everybody, it's me, John Ward, and I am back with another One Filmmaker, One Film, and today my guest is... Mindy Doherty. Thank you for being here. I really appreciate it. Um, I know this has taken a little bit, and uh, so I'm finally, you know, glad that you're here. So thanks for joining me today. I appreciate that. Thank you. Oh, yeah, sure, because I, I, I watched three half hour interviews with you. I watched like an audio one. I did some research online because I wanted to know who you were and all about okay. you. Now I know. <laughs> What'd about, you find it, out? <laughs> well, let's, <Google> me. <laughs> you know, let's just say I went into some dark areas. So, uh, <laughs> you know, um, no, no, but what now I know about you, what does, what can you tell the audience? What, who, who is Mindy? What is Mindy all about? What What is going on with Mindy? So I'm a United States Army veteran. I am a was a trauma nurse, interventional radiology nurse, and turned into a water therapist called Watsu Practitionership. And that is basically doing shiatsu massage in hot water. And that's why it's called Watsu. And I've dabbled into acting and uh, modeling I've been doing throughout my whole life. So. Um, that's kind of in and out. And then I just basically love taking photographs and being photographed at times. Um, and just gardening as well. <laughs> yes. I saw that you, you have a, uh, a large garden and you give away the, the vegetables for free. So there's a program called Feed My City and we got in touch with the local people that had farms and they bring in produce and so anything extra that they have they give to me and I go to this place called Neighborhood Impact and I give it to the largest food bank and shelter area though over there that, so it's not I think from that my really garden cool. but it's from theirs all together yeah I, I think that that's really awesome that you do that so Thank I mean you. you 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 seem to be quite the uh uh uh, entrepreneur of of things because you 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 got uh you know you were military uh actress writer uh i mean you're a gardener i mean you're uh, yeah. you're done an awful lot and we've been friends on facebook but have really never communicated and you sent me a message saying hey you know i'm coming out to vegas i'm shooting this this film, um, you know, which technically would be, I guess, Clown Motel 3, but it's Clown Motel Three Ways to Hell. And I do have, I do own the first one. Oh, okay. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, but don't don't own the second one because it hasn't come out yet. Uh, and uh, I am friends with the director, with Joseph Kelly. So uh, we've hung out when he was living here in, in Vegas. So, uh, okay, there uh, you go. Yeah, so I'm, I'm, uh, uh, wanting to see part two and uh so what can you and and it was like oh okay you're gonna be out here in vegas you're gonna be making this movie and all that stuff mm -hmm. and i thought it would be a little better to wait until you got done with the film that way we could get the whole experience and so it was, I would a, like it was definitely a learning experience i learned a lot on set um this one i created the character um as like a, a clown, it was I was given the the title clown, and so I chose vampire clown. So I went with a different type of makeup. I did um, kind of like research on what different vampires looked like, what different clowns looked like, and I tried to emulate different things. And and as I was practicing, I realized, wow, this makeup's hard to get off. And so I had to call <laughs> a friend of mine. I was like, how do you guys get this stuff off? And I did you know, really commit to it. So I ended up getting false teeth, the two little fangs, and um, and that was fun. And then I got my costume ready, and, and that was fun as well. And just creating the character and doing character building for this one was super fun. I got to kind of reach out of my own comfort zone into a character that's not of who I would display every day and so right. um at times i think that that's what's great about acting you can get out these emotions without in like a safety zone like anger aggression fear anxiety all that stuff and it's all you know sometimes gets discombobulated but i also think that because i did improv in it as well 
that it really helped from a standpoint of just going with the flow because sets are very long um, and and sometimes you're hot and sometimes you're cold and sometimes you're in between, sometimes you're hungry, you know, just all the things that go into it. But I guess I just didn't realize how much went into the filming and all the money it actually does take to ways to do filming, including, you know, the productions, the sound, all the things that you don't really typically think about, even from like the smallest nature of getting the locations built, you know, all, all these other things that I just didn't really consider until I started branching out with this movie called um, Bridge of the Doom and Arena Wars, which is available on Amazon Prime and Arena Wars just came out on uh, Paramount Plus and Showtime. And when I learned about that, all these are independent films that I've done. But what I've learned throughout the process is that each set has its different nuances and fun things about it. And then things you just got to kind of like figure out along the way, just like life, you know? And what's taught me the most is just trying to be really grounded and then figure out what character this is and then jump into that character and then make sure like when it says cut that I just remind myself like get out of the character because sometimes I think people can have the tendency to have their character go on and on and on and it's like okay cut <laughs> Yeah, and uh, uh, like I said, with Clown Motel, that's Joseph Kelly. But then the other two films, with uh, Bridge of the Doomed and Arena Wars, that's the Mahal Brothers. Yes, and... Mahal Brothers. So with the Mahal Brothers, I've done two films with them. And then Clown Motel 3, I did with Joseph Kelly. That was the last film that I did. And, yeah, and the, I... um, Arena Wars, as well as um, Bridge of the Doomed, is available on DVD as well. I have seen Bridge of the Doom. I went to the screening of it um, oh, since I worked with the Mahal brothers and I know Michael Sue and, and uh, you know, a bunch of them. Uh, I went to the screening of Bridge of the Doom and, and really enjoyed it. I mean, I love zombie movies. Um, I really want to see Arena Wars. So um, it, it's, it, it's nice because out here in Vegas, we do have a, a small but growing film community. Yeah, so, people work really, really hard on their on their characters, I think, in these films because they want it to turn out really well. They want to see themselves on the film. They want to see it get distributed. They want their friends to see it. They want memories, you know, and, and I think that's the greatest thing. No matter what happens from this point forward, if I decide to do a film or if I decide to quit this, I, you know, I'm, I'm really unsure at this point in time if I really even want to dip back in and do anything at this point. However, um, I'm going to take a pause <laughs> for a while until something actually fits what I really, really want to do for acting and then maybe embrace that. But for right now, I think um, that it's it's a lot. It's a, There's a lot that goes behind the scenes, too, in getting prepared for these things, too. So... What is a what was a day like on the set? Like like what time did you wake up? When did you go to bed? What was what was a day like? Uh, for Clown Motel Three, I think I got up around eight in the morning because I was at a hotel that had free breakfast, and Ooh, nice. <laughs> so I looked small. <laughs> breakfast is my biggest meal, so if I don't have breakfast, I'm not so happy. <laughs> so. I that was that. my biggest meal. So, yeah, I did that. So, probably around 10, I think, we showed up. One day, I think I showed up at 8. Another day, I think I showed up at 10. And then, I think I showed up at maybe 10 again. I can't. I, they have, All the days kind of, like, shove into one when you're doing a couple days. So, I think that's about the time. And then, we didn't end until sometimes, like, 10 p.m. midnight. And then I didn't get back until sometimes two the next morning. And then I just wake up a couple hours later. So it just depends on the day. It depends on how long you're filming. It depends on where you're filming. And at that time, it was super hot. And I'm type 1 diabetic. So I had to worry about my insulin. I had to worry about my food intake. I had to worry about all these things and components that other people don't have to take into factor. With their, They just go on vacation or do whatever they do. And for me... 
I have a neurological disorder as well. So I was in the army and I served in Bosnia, Croatia, Hungary, and Germany. And I was uh, the Presbos president, which is better opportunities for single soldiers trying to create a better community on base and was sent to Washington, D.C. to represent 20,000 soldiers and then came back and they installed different pieces into our base and helped 10th Special First Group to get better opportunities for them. And WCAP, which is World Class Athlete Program, we were they were training for the Olympics. So I have a variety of experiences in my life. You're absolutely right. I was a combat field medic in the Army. So I learned a lot thankfully in the military, which actually saved me when I was um, going through a really difficult time in 2014 when the VA wasn't treating us very well. And that's written in my book called A Resilient Warrior. And it looks like this. It's available on Amazon. And this is the back. And it basically just gives you a preview that says, you know, United States Army veteran. And then tells you a little glimpse of what it is. So you can take a look at that um, on amazon.com and the money goes basically back to Feed My City. So with with all of your experience, how did, um, I mean, I would guess with all the experience that you have being on a film set and, and waiting around and the action and all that, everything that you've been through because almost, you know, they've compared making a movie to going to war. You you could apply that to making the film, sitting there for hours, getting the makeup on, and and absolutely, and all of that. So how yeah. how does I mean you see the mostly like science fiction horror films, but yet you're a gardener, you're an author, you're you know uh, you're a vet, you're how is most people kind of stick maybe with one or two things you've done a whole bunch of things so <laughs> i have ADD and a ADHD, young age? so i honestly haven't really found my niche yet and i always told myself if i get bored in or if i'm at a place where i'm just unhappy with what i'm doing i need to pull out and do something different until I make myself happy again, because I am not going to be the best of who I can be if I don't even know who I am. So if we're not enriching our own lives, which I really believe in practicing self-awareness and I'm big on, you know, doing workshops. I've, I've did this for like 10 years and I've done 25 years of therapy. Which you'll find out why in my book. Um, and I've lived throughout my life as well you know i have four organs missing because of what the military oh. and the va mishaps have done and so be, by default i am a diabetic type one i take insulin so i have no pancreas no gallbladder no appendix and no duodenum so i've had three major surgeries cut from rib to rib and then the third one kind of did me over because that one took eight hours just to get to the actual organs and then they had to open up take it out oh, wow. um so i think i've just had so many different life experiences that since i've been in three comas as well i don't really treat death the same as everybody else would so if i'm not happy i want to make my life enriched at this point in time i know i'm only 47 i'll be 48 in december 8 and I'm not going to stop doing the different things until I find something that truly makes me happy. And I know that, you know, happiness comes from inside, but I also know when you find something that you really like and you really love, time goes by so fast, you don't even care about what you're doing. I haven't found that yet. And I know a lot of people have, and they're like, oh, I love acting because, you know, I wouldn't care if I had to do it for 15 hours, I would do it. You know, I'm like, okay, um, I don't really feel that way. Mm -mm. <laughs> yeah, so from from you being like a young girl up to making Plan Motel 3, can you kind of, you know, take so us actually, through I actually everything. started, my mom reminded me, I was in Angels in the Outfield when I was 10 years old. Uh, oh. I think it was either 10 or 12, and I can't remember. But I went to Nickelodeon Studios, and there was a um, 
program on television called Double Dare, and I wanted to get slimed. So I asked my mom, you know, how how, how do I get super slimed? I want to get super slimed. So my mom did like this little investigation. We were finding out like how do you get slimed, and I couldn't remember my lines because my memory was bad. <laughs> and, and I got stem cells, which I would love to come back to. So we'll talk about that um, yes. later as well. But so far, um, with all that I have done, let's see, what were you saying? I forgot. Well, like from when you were a young girl. Oh, 10. To... Yes. Yeah. So I started at Angels in the Outfield. That's right. I was an extra. Yes. And what they had us do is flapping our wings during when the baseball game was and then where they say i think where they come you'll they're when you see they'll come or something like that it was so long ago i don't even remember but i didn't really my mom is actually the actress she she loves it she could do it all day she writes you know plays and gets people together she's the one that did it so she kind of like wanted me to do it and i tried it and it just wasn't for me even as a kid it just wasn't for me the, actually, the only reason that I dipped back into it is because I had anger issues from literally being tortured for four months at the San Antonio, Texas VA hospital. And it's in my book oh. as well. And the things that went on are just undescribable and, you know, not fair, but it really taught me a valuable lesson because I was bed bound for three and a half years so or three years and eight months, actually. So I had to learn mentally how to literally go from riding for a hundred mile ride with the American Diabetes Association doing American diabetes tours and doing like cycle runs and stuff like that, where you're like training for a hundred mile ride and basically getting donations for it, you know, for the American Diabetes Association. Going from that to being bed bound was very difficult because I was always active. I mean, I I never had a time where I didn't run. I was running track and field. I did soccer. I wrestled in my senior year. I did water polo in my senior year. I played soccer my whole life. So I was into sports while my mom wanted me into, wanted to push me into modeling and stuff like that. So she wanted me to do acting and modeling my whole life. So I was in pageants from age, I don't even know, baby to like, 18, I finally told her, okay, this is the last one. Like, for real, like, if I win or lose, this is the last one. Well, I happened to win Miss San Francisco Bay Teen USA, and she was trying to bait me for another one. And I was like, no, we're done. Like, that's it. So I realized she was never going to be done. And that I had to make the ultimate choice to figure out how I could get away from my mom's control because it was just getting to be too much. And so I think when families or parents try to push you towards a, a a thing, whatever it is, sports, military, whatever, theater, whatever their dream is for you to be, kind of shoves them away or shoved me away. Made me did not want it at all. But after the experience of 2014, I met somebody in 2000, like 2020 or 2019, somewhere around there. And he had said, you know, why don't you join me for this class called improv? And I'm like, what is that? He's like, you know, you can get out your emotions. It's fun. It's funny. You're really, really funny. And I think that this would get you through your emotions. Like you've done all this therapy that you're talking about, but come to this class with me. I'm like, all right, I got nothing to lose. Oh my God, that was the best thing I've ever done in my life. So I went and did that for a couple of years and I was like, wow. And then I got people that were literally like, dude, you should really try stand up. So I want to get stem cells, which I had a stem cell utilization up in, I've had two stem cell transplants uh, in, or infusions, as I say, um, in the United States. And then I've had two in Colombia, two in the United States did not work. The two with bioaccelerator did work in, in the Colombia. And I'll be going back March 2005 when they open up in Mexico because I live on the West Coast so I can fly to San Diego and then go into Mexico. And what they're going to do is they're going to get the stem cells, which is from the umbilical cord, and then basically do all their medical stuff and do all of the testing to make sure there's no diseases, no cancer, nothing's wrong. They do the genealogies and they actually show you the actual cells on a microscope and they give you an actual printout, which is really cool. 
because they're, they're doing medical research. And at the time, I was the worst that they'd ever seen. So I really had nothing. No, I was, you know, I had everything to gain, you know, and I was on ketamine literally every other day, 400 milligrams of ketamine every other day. So when I tell you that there was no room for me to like mess up, there just wasn't, you know, I was having seizures monthly and it was getting to the point where I was foaming at the mouth and didn't even know it, you know, and I, being where I'm at, wasn't very safe anymore. So I, I went and got stem cells and, and the first one, you know, was okay because I did the IV, but then I learned about intrathecal. So I came back and got the intrathecal one and that one worked, it crosses the blood brain barrier. So it helps basically your brain and helps your joints. And I have herniated discs and bulging discs all throughout my neck and my back. So it's very painful with this disease called chronic regional pain syndrome. And what that is, it's the neurological burning that goes from my toes all the way up to my brain. And sometimes I can talk, sometimes I can't, sometimes I'm sweating, sometimes I'm not. Sometimes my face gets red, sometimes my hands get super red. My friend's like, whoa, I didn't, what's happening to you? And I'm like, yeah, I'm burning right now. And they're like, all right, well, you know, they know not to touch me. So there's certain things that my friends have even like have had to ask me like can i hug you and i'm like not today today's not a good day so when i got stem cells intrathecally my friends can hug me now i can understand people i can allow people more mm, leeway for mistakes you know i'm not i'm not as angry you know so all in all stem cells is the thing that has worked best for me personally and now it got me off like 14 different medications as well that i thought that i needed Turns out I didn't need that, you know, and so I, I I almost warned myself, like, be careful what pharmaceuticals I'm taking because it does do damage to the body, you know. There's no doubt it doesn't do damage to the body. And I have damaged my body through the years because I had pancreatitis for eight years. So while I was going through nursing school, I had pancreatitis, I'd get sick, go to the hospital, study for an exam, get out of the hospital, take the exam get done with the exam, go right back to the hospital, get an IV back in there. And then for two weeks, you'd have to be on bed rest and basically you're not eating. And so at the time, that's how they took care of it. Now you can walk around, but you still can't eat because if you eat, it basically secretes enzymes that basically give you pancreatitis even worse, you know, because it stimulates the pancreas to start digesting. You don't want digestion to happen during pancreatitis. Inevitably, what happened is I've had pancreatitis for longer than eight years. It was going on the ninth year. And I was like, look, I can't not take any more. You know, I want to go through nursing school and you guys keep pausing it because of this. You know, somebody's got to help me. So my mom looked up the, a place. And on the second one, I went to USC, the first one. And it's called a pusto where they open up the pancreas and they take the head off. That didn't work. So then they go in and they take the tail off. That didn't work. So that was USC twice. Then my mom found out in Minnesota, there was this guy who doesn't do it anymore. Dr. Sutherland, he's a blessing in disguise because he gave his wife a kidney 10 days before he gave me surgery. That's how committed this guy was. And I was like, wow, you're amazing, dude. And I've never heard of this, but this is, you know, he's like, you know, you, I need to do this for you. And, and he was right. Because I literally was at the last of it. You know, I, I had lost too much weight. People were definitely scared. I was whitish gray is what they had told me. I would literally turned gray before their eyes. And they're like, oh, God. So I went in for eight hours of surgery. They didn't know whether I was going to live or die. I guess I coded a couple times. I was in ICU for days. You know, you know, this was the third coma that I had been put into. So it was like, I didn't know what was going to happen after this. But there was a lot of memory loss. There was a significant barriers to get through this time versus the last two times. Um, the first time, you know, people say they saw white light or anything. I didn't see white light. I actually saw American Indians at a, a fire site, you know, joining a drum the first time. Oh. Second time I didn't okay. see anything. I was just like, oh, okay, I thought I slept. I couldn't understand why everybody was stressing out at my table. I'm like, what's up, man? And they're like, oh, they've been gone for like a week. I'm like, no, nah. I was just sleeping, <laughs> you know, because I didn't know. And I always made jokes at everything, you know, they were like, do you ever take anything serious? And I was like, no, you know, 
So the improv definitely helped me get through my emotions, but it is all the acting all the way up until now. And why I say I'm satisfied because I think I've worked through literally every single emotion throughout all of these things that I've been doing up until now. And with the therapy that I've done as well, because it's multiple therapies, it's not just like talking therapy, it's equine therapy, neurotherapy, brain therapy, physical therapy, eye therapy, speech therapy, tongue therapy to make sure that your tongue's right going the right way, making sure your eyes are going the right way. I mean, it was a lot involved to, to try to get back to basic health after what they did to me in 2014 as well. How to relearn how to walk, how to talk, and everything. And at the time, I was stuttering a lot until I met this guy named Robbie Grayson. And he knew a guy named Boone Cutler, who's a veteran, who ended up going and getting stem cells. And that's how I got stem cells. And both of them saved my life. Whether they know it or not, I tell them all the time, thank you so much. And I'm much gratitude to them and to BioAccelerator because they literally got me to here. And I praise BioAccelerator for everything that they've done with the research and they've done. And I can't wait till they open up in Mexico because they're going to be able to help so many more people with the access there. And I think it's great. So with everything that that you do, you know, the acting, the writing, the gardening, all that, these are all, to a degree, physical activities. Yeah, right. So before the stem cells, before all of this, were you able to stand on a set for two hours waiting for them to yell action no. could you sit and just type or be no. in a garden and, and lean up and down while you're planting things no. i fell actually on bridge of the doom matter of fact i had to get help walking to each spot that we were going to on set because my left ankle still wasn't stable yet and i kept falling on my face and i was so embarrassed Oh. But they were like, come on, we'll help you. And I was like, okay, cool. Because I told them a little bit of the background. And then they were like, oh, my God, well, of course we'll help you. You know, because when you read my book, it, it's challenging for people that know me. And I get it now because I'm like, it's not that hard. Just read it, you know. But then if you care about me, it, it is difficult because I have gone through the ringer. And what I mean by that is I've had so many different traumatic experiences spiritually sexually physically and verbally assaulted in all these different ways and i and i figured out a way from childhood to now to not only embrace it but to help other people figure out like where they're at sometimes and i've had a lot of people you know i'm big on prevention of suicide and suicide awareness so when i get my stem cells i'd really like to do public speaking I want to wait until I get this next stem cell because I think it's going to progress my future even further. Um, to be honest with you, I couldn't really do much before stem cells. At the time that I went for stem cells, I was actually couch and bed bound again. My friends had seen me and they were really scared. Uh, when I got there, I was turning gray again in front of my friend's eyes and the doctor's eyes. And Dr. Halpern was, was, you know, she's the only one that saved me, basically. She's like, let's do it, you know. She's the one who believed in me. So I will dedicate my life to BioAccelerator and tell them, Eric with the CEO, you know, all of them, the, the whole team, it takes the whole team, I get it. But the, the people that instructed this and got this together, I really genuinely owe them my life. And I have so much gratitude because I went from bed bound to at least being able to walk again, talk again, and hang out with my friends again for however long I live, you know, because there's been so much that's gone on in my life that nobody's ever promised tomorrow. I get it. However, I'm at stage four osteoporosis as well. So there's a lot going on in my body that, you know, with stem cells, again, I'm going to come back and then come back, you know, so it's an amazing system our body is and, and, you know. I'm going to run it to the rig and I'm a medical researcher as well. So I'm in a couple books with doctors and I've done research as well on my own. And I was in studies for the diabetes as well uh, at University of Colorado, at Denver. So it's been really amazing. I've had, if I look back, meeting Buzz Aldrin at, or Buzz Aldridge at, he's the second guy on the moon. When I, 1999, I still have an envelope signed by him. 
So oh, nice. Literally from like that point until like up until now, like life experience has definitely given me a mixture of everything and a bag of nuts. But I always tell people sometimes I'm a bit bag of mixed nuts. You know, I think everybody's got a little nutty every, everywhere somewhere, you know, but I try to embrace everything as like one day at a time it's hard sometimes and I, I have to draw that back and say it's not one day at a time it's one minute at a time right at this point because sometimes my anxiety takes over and it's like okay 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 let me just practice breathing again because I think I forgot how to breathe you know and just get back to the mechanics of breathing and you know there's different ways to breathe and I, I learned that from this book called breathe and I was like oh, okay let me try these different breath patterns you know I'm like oh, okay this works yeah, and, and uh, you know, you just mentioned, uh, you know, books and your book and stuff. You, you just don't have a resilient warrior, but you also have Mindy's Fight and uh, uh, children's books. Yes, I'm really, really excited about. So Mindy's Fight was actually the most angry, honest, <laughs> oh my goodness, before stem cells, before a lot of therapy, <laughs> which is anger spewing details of what happened, who it was, hmm, didn't care, thought I was dying. So I was like, here's all my wishes, grandma, because my grandma wanted me to write. So I was like, all right, she's dying, so I better write it quick, you know? So I actually wrote it for her. She read it on her birthday, and she was very proud of me. So that's, I think, my biggest achievement, honestly, is this book through, again, my friend Robbie Grayson and other friend Malachias and Boone uh, Cutler as well. And so I really get it that it takes a community to bring us together. And even when I think I'm alone, I'm genuinely not. You know, there are people that care. There are people that are just caught up in their own world. And I think sometimes people get so caught up in what they're doing and comparing themselves with other people that they forget to live their lives in, in their own moment and realize whatever patterns that they have created in their life. You have two choices. You can acknowledge where you're at and move backwards and keep looking in your rear view mirror. Or you can take a reevaluation of yourself right now and say, where am I at? What am I doing? How do I feel about what I'm doing? Am I even happy anymore? What will make me happy again? And have I done everything I tried it like is was it hard enough or was it easy enough to get me through to the next stage did I do enough to like be done certain things in my life are completely done and I'm like okay I'm done with this chapter and then there's other things I need you know definitely need to work on and I think everybody needs to work on you know it'd be great if people would work on themselves a little bit but my biggest thing is again suicide prevention because I've had more friends than not because I, I was a medic so I have had you know, many people come to me with this. So I really want to inspire people to just hold on, you know, if you like give you an ounce of hope, then maybe you can turn it into a pound, you know, just wait a minute, you know, just wait until the next day, you know, because things might be brighter the next day, you know, and then that next day, just get through that day and then go through the next day, you know, and don't worry too much about the future because if you start worrying about the future, like Eckhart Tolle, you know, preaches about he basically says if you're too much in the past meaning if your memories are stuck in the past or you're thinking too much in the future and you're like oh my god i gotta get there i gotta get there your body really doesn't know the difference between the fear of the known and the unknown which is the conscious and the subconscious which means your body is running chemicals through its body trying to fight trying to fight trying to fight there's nobody fight you know, and what I found is after being a trauma nurse and being in the military, I craved being stimulated, really. And I didn't know how big of a stimulation I needed until the events of 2014. And I had to do a lot of thinking because <laughs> I was bed bound and I had to figure it out literally for a couple of weeks on my own. So and that's what I'm saying. When you when you're down at your lowest of your low. And, and there's people that come and save you. 
those are the angels that are like here on earth, you know? And I, and I almost wonder like all these religious wars are making me sad, you know? And I don't even care what religion or what politician you follow. I hate this right now. I just wish that people would just see people as people and then we could just like get along somehow. And if you didn't get along peacefully, move on or just go to the people that you get along with, you know, and crowd around them. But I don't, I, this divisiveness, this anger, I'm over it. <laughs> I have a sign at my door literally that says no politics, no religion, and no soliciting because I'm, I'm over it right now. Three, three, three things you should never do. <laughs> you should never discuss right? these things. So it, it's, yeah, because with, um, I mean, it, it seems that you could almost recommend to people, like, you know, because of, of what you've experienced, Correct. does acting work for you? You could recommend that to people. Maybe that would be their thing or writing or gardening or even right. being in the military, you know, yeah. you, you could, you could recommend all these things. And, uh, so it, it's interesting of just how much you've been through, how much you've done. And it, it's because I was looking at like at the movies here and I was surprised about some of these because of everything that you've been through. I mean, uh, you have stuff like, uh, as an actress, you have <laughs> Appetite for Sin. You have Z, mm -hmm. Dead End, of course, Climatel 3, uh, Cheer Bloody Murder. You got the Arena Wars, uh, Brain Hunter New Breed, uh, Bridge of <laughs> Doom. I mean, you you have a lot of stuff here, even as a producer. You you, you know, you have things, Cheer Bloody Murder, Bridge of the Doomed. Uh, I With everything you've been through, have you do horror films and sci-fi movies kind of, is that like a release for you or why not comedies? Why not dramas or, or action films? I, like you're actually play a nurse. To be honest with you is it was the person that I met that brought me into a horror community. Cause I didn't really know about the horror community until I did improv. And then I met this soldier online on Facebook and he was telling me what he was doing. And he's like, well, you know, I'm doing this one thing down here. Why don't you check it out? So we met at that point. And then from there on, he actually introduced me to Bridge of the Doom and to the Mahals and everything else. And so that's how that relationship started, to be honest with you. I didn't know that they were in the horror genre. I didn't even know really about any of this acting stuff, to be honest with you, because I'd taken a step back. You know, I'm, when I was 10, nothing counts when you're a child and you're coming back, you know, and I didn't do anything big. So it's like, you, you don't, can't count extra work. You can't even count that. <laughs> what I did, you know, zippy do you die, you know, who cares? <laughs> Nobody cares about that. You know, I don't even care if I did anything big as a child. It just, none of this stuff, like the trophies that I have, the medals that I have, I'm grateful for them. But when you ask me, like, why did you do so many things? I think because I was seeking happiness, not realizing I had to fulfill it in myself. You know what I mean? Like, I was looking outwardly to figure out, like, what was going to get me that next high or, or, you know, mentally or, you know, I'd run races and, you know, and I'd win and I'd be like, oh, why, you know, why am I upset? You know, and I was just like, I don't, I don't understand. And that was because I cheated myself, you know. And I knew I could have done better or, you know, I got second place and I knew I could have just put in an extra effort, you know. And so it just it doesn't seem like nothing was ever good enough. And so I just kind of figured that after this film, I'd get back into writing. And so I'm actually writing another book oh, nice. <laughs> called Trigger Warnings. And that's all about, like, <laughs> getting people through the trauma. Like, okay. I've been therapized, if that's ever a word. I use Mindyisms. People that know me very well know I go on my tangents. And that means, like, stand-up routines sometimes. <laughs> it's comedy hour, you know, for them. And so it's good to practice on friends anyways. <laughs> anyway, so throughout all these experiences, they wouldn't have taught me to be who I am now. So... All in all, I'm grateful for all the experiences, even the bad ones at this point in time. I thought I was going to regret something. 
I thought I was missing out on something. And now I realize, oh, the universe has a beautiful way if we listen to keep us on the path if we're truly listening. You know, we say we're listening, but are we hearing it? You know, are we really taking the time to hear what people are saying? Or are you just thinking about what you want to say? And then the next person gets to say, and then, oh, I'm going to fight this. That's not really listening. Listening means that you're taking what they're saying in, reflecting on it for a second and being like, okay, this is what I think, you know, and having a conversation that's at least knowledgeable, you know, or tangible to where you can acknowledge each other's presence. You know, I think right now people are so divisive that they just want to be heard and then they get louder and louder and louder. And it's not the people that are, you don't need to be louder. It's not that I didn't hear you the first time. Yes, I heard you the first time. I might not have understood you. However, maybe we can get to an understanding if I understand where you're coming from. But if you don't allow me to get to where you're coming from, how am I ever going to learn any different? And I think when I learn about people, then I can understand the differences and help accommodate them better too, you know, as a human being. But my mind always goes to nursing. You know, I've been a caretaker since I was basically three for my mom. So I literally was doing massages and everything for my mom, like I think 12, because things basically fell on her head and we always made fun of her until she needed to wear a helmet because she'd really in the store and things would like literally just off the wall. I'm like, oh my gosh, mom, you got bad karma. I can't stand next to you. I'm like, these are his kids horribly. <laughs> That was horrible. And so um, I think, like I said, I, I just feel blessed and grateful for where, where I'm at and all the lessons that I've learned up until now. So you you were a trauma nurse. What exactly is trauma as as far as being a nurse is? Sure. So I would I was taking on PACU, which means patients that come from surgery. I would take care of them after they were done two options. They either go home with their person that got them there, or they go up to the floor and get taken care of because they had a longer surgery and need more recovery time. Or the third option is they go to the ICU because they're literally dying and nobody dies in PACU. So you send them to the ICU. They, you know, do have, they have all the machines capable that, that we don't, you know, and we, we keep your airway. We're there designed to take care of you after surgery. And then ICUs critical care, you know, and they're they're the they're the whizzes, you know, to be honest with you. They they do a lot of work even though they're taking care of two patients, because a lot of people get resentful and they're like, oh, they're only taking care of two patients. It's like, no, 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 no. They've got to do so much monitoring and so much medication and so much mathematics all the time because brain changes are important, you know, pressures are important. All these things that people don't think about in the background that, that you have to think about. For me, what got me into a rush was honestly doing CPR in the airport when a pilot dropped in and had a heart attack. And my friend was going to the Bahamas, so that's the only reason why I was at the airport. And I was like, something doesn't feel right. She's like, what? And I'm like, something doesn't feel right. And I heard a pump. And I was like, I'll be right back. And they followed me. And I was like, oh, shit, because he's, you know, turning blue. So I did CPR and I'm like, anybody's a nurse, anybody, you know, anybody, anybody. And they were like, oh, and then some people started to come and one person did the mouth and I was doing the heart. We got him somewhat and then, you know, starting to go. So go, 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 go. Then I had access to an IV and I was like, boom. And I was like very much very quick because I was by that time, 1999, I was extremely trained, especially with IVs. I mean, IVs, you could stick me on a rolling pin and I probably would get it in. I was getting it in thumbs. I would, you know, ICU nurses were like, hey, can you come over and get this one? I'm like, yeah, sure. Get it in people's toes. You know, I was really, really good at what I did. I was a really, really good nurse. However, in 2014, because of the events that happened to me, which you can read in my book, um, I have chosen to not go back. And that's kind of like part of the resiliency because I really thought that the medical community was going to be like my end all be all, you know, I thought, I thought that's what I was put into this world to be. Oops, sorry. I thought that's what I was put into this world to be. And it just so happened that that wasn't my karma. You know, I, I mistaken it for my karma 
but it wasn't, you know, it, it was meant to put me on the path, the very, very path that I'm on now. And it's confusing me now because I'm in the unknown and I'm not used to the unknown. So I have to think about like, what's next? And I don't know yet. With Writing your- trigger warnings is what's next. Oh, you said my children's book as well. That one is, a, I, I need to get that one um, illustrated the of, and then edited first. And we're working on that. But this one is about lessons and it's creating a universal commitment, basically, to, to help children learn, like, whatever I do affects you. So if I take your vegetable out of the garden and I take your carrot and that's the last one and you're excited, get out of bed. <laughs> I'm going to go out to get the garden. Oh my gosh, where's my carrot? You have no food. So now you're starving. So what I want to teach children is don't steal. You know, why, what happens when you have consequences and why you don't do it? Like why this would affect other people. Yeah. And, and um, one of the interviews I watched, you, you have a kid's book called uh, A Dragon's Voice. That sounds, that's the one I'm talking about. Yeah. That's the one. Okay. And, and, yeah. and that one sounded interesting. So how many kids books do you have? That's the only one. However, I wanted to write a, another one. I have to take a pause on that one. Cause I don't know if that will be suitable in, in the environment that we're in right now. So I'm taking a, very much backseat on that one because it's not it's just not the right timing with the politics going on and the religious things going on so i I just i don't want people to politicize it and i don't want them to take my military background and use it against me either so i'd rather just kind of take this one and see where it goes like I, i don't know where it goes you know to be honest with you I wrote it because I couldn't read when I was a child. So the, there's lessons on almost each page or like on the pages that matter, basically. That's like the lesson for what you just read. Because what I have a problem with and still have a problem with, that's why I'm hoping stem cells can help fix the rest, is picturing while I'm reading. You know, if I can't picture it, then I can't see it. If I can't see it, I can't remember it. You know, if you can see it, you can at least feel it, you know, try to memorize it in that way, you know, or you can feel it and you know, embrace yourself in it. I don't have that capability and you know? I have to figure out different ways of learning. So learning has always been a struggle for me. And, and, and now I'm finding that stem cells are working a little better because anybody that's ever met me prior to stem cells has only said that I'm a complete 180. I'm not even who I was a year ago. So I have to take what they have to say. And then I just saw my practitioner who's known me for now 10 years, literally. I saw her yesterday or whatever Friday was. And she told me the same thing. She's like, you're totally new now after stem cells. You know, you've changed a lot significantly. And I was like, okay, if she noticed a difference and she's known me for this long, I'm going to take that into consideration because I, I wouldn't have known, you know, I, I need feedback, you know, like, Hey, what do you notice? You know? So there's just been so many changes that I think I just want to continue on learning different things and seeing what makes me happy again. So have you with your, <coughs> excuse me, with your experiences of being like a trauma nurse and things like that, you know, like John Grisham, a lawyer, So he took Uh that one thing and wrote an endless amount of books about lawyers. And a lot of people seem to have that one incident that they can write a book off of and maybe make a movie out of. But you as a trauma nurse, for years, you probably have a lot of experience. Have you thought of kind of spinning that off into a character that could be in books and maybe made into like a films and I things like that. I kind of just took my experiences with it, but I could I could venture into that. That is something I might think about. That's a good oh. idea. Okay. Maybe okay. message me that. <laughs> yeah. Message me that idea. <laughs> I think I might take that idea. <laughs> maybe yeah, spin maybe. it off. But you know you, you don't really get much money in books. I mean, that's the thing about it. So you have to love writing, you know, just to write the books, get them published, get them out on Amazon. 
you pay for the printing. So, you know, you pay for the marketing, you pay for PR, you pay for everything pretty much just so people know, <laughs> just so they know the backgrounds of it. So it's, it's a lot of work and then it's a lot of marketing. And if people don't catch on, you get nothing. <laughs> so you get no return on a, a stack of a wish, you know? So I just kind of want to make sure that this first one does well, and then we'll see, you know, this and is my first book that I actually even really, I mean, I really genuinely did it because of my grandma. You know, I didn't really think about writing another book. It just, it just happened that, that I was like, oh, and people are like, you know, when's your next book? And I'm like, what do you mean when's my next book? I just wrote this book. They're like, <laughs> yeah, but you have like, everybody has a second book. And I'm like, well, not everybody's me. Cause I didn't think about it. You know, I was like, why would I write another book? book i just wrote this thing but i didn't realize that writers literally write books you know like the <laughs> you know but it didn't process with me because i didn't have that comprehension like i said before stem cells after stem cells i've been able to understand things in addition i've been doing hyperbaric oxygen therapy which has genuinely helped significantly as well puts in oxygen to the brain so you get extra oxygen throughout the body and it's pressurized so you'll go into a tank for about 90 minutes to two hours and it's beautiful it helps the body helps the brain helps memory it's good yeah and and now is that something that you do for yourself or do you help with other people do that no that's something i do for myself and then when you go to the stem cells they they have a machine out there that you get into their chamber twice after you get stem cells because what it does is it proliferates the stem cells even more which means you're getting all these new growths so you want as much growth as you possibly can that they put it in so you want that in that compressed area that's why they have you lay flat on your back for as long as they do so that people understand it it's for your spinal cord you want where the stem cells are supposed to be so if they tell you to lay flat the reason they're telling you to lay flat is i had every single facet in my back then you can look that up where the spinal cord is because i have neurological burning all throughout my neck and underneath where basically your hips kind of sit lower back and then i have a lot of herniations and bulging discs throughout so they put the stem cells through so i still need more because of the damage that was done and they warned me about that and i was fine with that i already understood that however my Friend that's a veteran had two intrathecal stem cells with bioaccelerator. And the reason I want to share this is he's a veteran. He couldn't see, he couldn't understand, and he couldn't walk before stem cells. After the second intrathecal, he can walk, his vision's back to 2020, and he can understand you. And his mom called me to tell me this. So for the mom to reach out to let me know to thank me that much, it, it meant so. It meant the world to me. It, it meant that I made such a difference that somebody took my word because it's an investment. You know, you have to understand you're gonna invest. You know, you're either gonna invest in surgery and you're gonna invest all that money on the off time that you don't realize about, like the rehab and the time off that you have to take off work. People aren't like gather up that amount of money and and realize that it's just worth stem cells you know stem cells are worth it because you don't have to, sometimes you don't have to do surgery whereas americans are like i must do surgery and i'm like no you must not do surgery no no, no. let me save your child for just a moment you know let me give you another option and then if you want to do surgery that's okay because that's your option but let me introduce you to this option and then if you don't want it that was my two cents and I tried. Well, and, and I'm for stem cell research. And, and yeah. there is a, uh, there's a Family Guy episode where Peter has a stroke and he spends uh -huh. the entire episode with a stroke. So half of his body is, is all messed up. Right. And he walks into, basically drags his body into a building that just says stem, stem cell research. Right on. And the, he turns around, he walks out, he's perfectly fine, and he goes, why are we funding this? And, <laughs> oh, and, yeah, because it's all government conspiracy. No, yeah, I'm just kidding. And, so the, the problem is the FDA doesn't approve it in America, and that's why. So they're approving certain stem cells, but they didn't work for me, to be honest with you. Uh, there was a lot of money wasted, that, and I'll be honest with you, because 
it just didn't work. The ones in Colombia worked, you know, there's proof it's worked. <laughs> so I have proof it's worked, you know. If they could take the worst in the world and, you know, still get me, all right, great. You know, let's see what they could do for other people. You know, they, they help people with MS, you know, help people with Parkinson's. They help people that are in wheelchairs that cannot walk, that have, that have literally gone from cripple to, and they've been crippled like for, you know, I had over 20 years on these people, you know, and they're getting them back up to functioning at least, you know, and this one guy I saw couldn't hold his baby at all. And now he can at least hold his baby and eat, you know, and to me, th that brings at least hope to a paraplegic, whereas a lot of these people that are like done, they just want to be done, you know, and I can understand why they're like, I just want my old life back. And I'm like, I don't hear you, you know, and being a trauma nurse and knowing that they're going to be paralyzed for the rest of their life and having to help them understand it. Look, there is no more. They're the, you know, because their brain's still thinking, oh, I'm going to walk. No, you're not. Dude. I got to help you understand you're never going to walk again. And I have to break that to you. You know, when the doctor tells you that, then I get to help you understand what he just said in his Google language because they talk up here sometimes and it's like hey dude why don't you talk to this dude like a five-year-old or 12 year old or like somebody who comprehends like a little bit lower some for some and then if you understand it great you know if you're a researcher nurse like i am or whatever you know it's different but most people don't have the same knowledge that we do and they take it for granted and i used to you know I, but i learned so i genuinely thank you for your time I appreciate your hour. This was so amazing. Oh, yeah. yeah, thank you. And and one last question for you then. Well, actually sure. two, if you don't mind. Oh, sure. One, do you still have the farm with the chickens where you give away the free eggs? Because I think that's no. very cool. No. I no. actually gave my chickens away to my bonus sister who has them now. And they are providing for her family and my other family's family. So I was content with that. Okay. And then what are you, you mentioned that you're working on a new book, any new movies coming up, any, anything that people can look forward to and where can they find these things? So, nope. I have nothing in the future planned. Is that's why I said I I'm actually taking a step back and got to figure that out. What's next? Okay. Now, if I am writing, out. like I said, I am writing the trigger warnings. There is paragraphs, and it's just like the beginning stage. You know, there's just like a collection of ideas. You know, and that's where you start really in writing because people ask, well, how do you write? You know, because you, you I just offhandedly write. I actually don't really edit my stuff. That's why sometimes it's misspelled. And I'm like, oh, well, they'll figure it out, you know. If people want to get, you know, nitty gritty, you know, then most of the time, you know, a lot of the times I'll make sure it's good. But if I'm on the internet just trying to get somebody something, you know, they'll figure it out. Right. So <laughs> I'm just basically going to be writing trigger warnings and then maybe writing poetry and then just writing about different experiences that I've had just in my journal so that I can figure out what's next and what's going to like, what is the next phase of my life? Cause I'm headed towards 50. So that's going to be half century soon. So I better figure out like, what's the next half of my, whatever life that I get, you know? And what if somebody were to reach out to you? They see you in one of these movies, Arena Wars or Bridge of the Doom. They're like, I want to work with her. Can they do that? Sure. They can message me on Facebook at Mindy Doherty. They can Instagram me at Water Gypsy, spelled W-T-R-G-P-S-Y. So it's Water Gypsy without the vowels because I'm a water practitioner. And I was a gypsy my whole life, so I moved all around. Uh, so it just kind of came together. Um, and I'm on LinkedIn as Mindy Doherty. I'm on I think TikTok as Mindy Doherty. They're pretty much the platforms are the same. If you find me, my face is the same on all the platforms, pretty much. Okay. All right. Well, great. There we go. Well, thank you for being here. I really do appreciate it. And thank you for taking the time. And, um, I'll, put down some links below for you so you know people Great. can definitely you know check out what you've done yeah you so, can check yeah. out my imdb and check out my book uh resilient warrior 
on Amazon.com. It's available in 17 countries. If you're in Deschutes County, Oregon, it's free at the library. There's also an e-reader if you don't feel like getting the book anymore. There's an e-reader. It's cheaper. Um, and then uh, that's it. That's all I got. <laughs> There's some podcasts that are also listed somewhere, but I really can't remember. People have often asked me if I do voiceovers, and that's fine with me. I would absolutely love to do voiceovers. would love to do, if I was asked, like, what I wanted to do next. Okay, if I could phase into that, and then we'll say goodbye. Because um, I have people waiting for me, and I told them ahead of time. I'm like, okay, I'm going to give them an hour, and then you know, <laughs> I'm going to hop back with you guys. I'm sorry. <laughs> but, uh, but I love this. So um basically phasing it into like what is next is basically just figuring out those pieces you know and show the book one more time and then i'll let you go oh, just want sure. people to to leave with the image of the book in their head there you go a resilient warrior you can pick that up on amazon and i'll put a link down below for that so okay there we go and then here's the back and that's yep. why this label You'll see this label on Bridge of the Doom. Oh, okay. It's actually which in is the movie. Speed by City. Oh, sweet. Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, so thank I mean, you. that's why I love those memories because I'll have them for the rest of my life. Oh yeah, yeah. That's what's great about film. It's right there. You can always watch it. I, I've seen like the Clown Motel three trailer. I think looks great. I'm going to put that down below. You're in okay. the trailer, so that mm -hmm. looks pretty. You know, you look pretty cool in that. So. Thank you. All right, Mindy. Thank you very much. Yes, the much. new trailer, I believe, dropped on Friday, or did I think he's dropping a newer one on YouTube? I think. I think I know. I saw there was a teaser, and then I saw a longer one on on Friday. Yeah, I, I think, think he wants us to wait until he puts out another one, which has the credits at the at the bottom. If there's credits on the bottom, then yeah, share it. But when I did check i didn't see that one so or message you know what message him personally message him <laughs> that would be the best actually just reach out to joe <laughs> since you okay. guys know each other yeah yeah he said that he would come on one filmmaker one film when he got done with part three so once i get oh great them, oh there, you go. So, there yeah, you go yeah yeah so all right mindy thank you very much i know you got people waiting for you and um have a good rest of the day and um proud of you many people are proud of you of what you've done and achieved so please continue doing that you know you're, oh you're thank you so much that's so appreciated I appreciate oh yeah yeah it. sure you're welcome and i will see everybody on the next one filmmaker one film thanks bye